life-changing words. That's God's word, isn't it? Sometimes we hear it in song, sometimes we hear it in sermons, sometimes we read it, sometimes it's in a poem. But you know, we all have favorite verses, don't we? Anybody got a favorite verse? I, I got lots of them become my favorites, and, and they become our favorites because they speak to us in time of trouble, sometimes they encourage us to keep going, sometimes they just soften and uh, help our hearts when we're hurting. Some of them uh, we have memorized and they become part of us and they bring confidence and encouragement. But you know, there's five verses I want to share with you today. Now, it's not certainly comprehensive, but there's five that I want to share with you today that I believe would absolutely change our lives completely if we truly, truly believe them. Now, how many of us would say, I believe God's word? How many would say, I believe all of God's word? Not just parts or picking out pieces, I believe it all. Well, let me tell you what, if we believe God's word, as one person said, what you believe will determine how you behave. In other words, if God's word is really real to us and we believe it, then it's going to have an effect on how we live our lives for Christ. So let me share some verses with you. The first one is Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. It's one that speaks and deals about love, your love. It says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. When it comes to the saying of Jesus, this one is probably one that gives us all a lot of trouble sometimes until we dive into it and understand it. I've heard many young mothers ask how can they love Jesus more than they love their own child. And furthermore, how could God expect them to do that? How would God expect me to love him more than my child? We know we love our children. And God is not saying not to love our children. But Jesus wasn't suggesting that we neglect them either. He is certainly wants us to love our children and pour our lives into them because they are the next generation and we're actually commanded to raise our children in the teachings and the applications that God has given us in his word. Nor was he suggesting that we just like Jesus or like God, love our children and just maybe like them and like God too. That's not what he was saying. The Son of God who became the Savior of the world, our Savior, demands and deserves to be first place in our hearts in every aspect of our lives, every area. Not just on Sundays or on Wednesdays or when we bow our head for prayer, but 24-7. I believe he was showing us what the first and greatest commandment in the Bible is, as we see in Mark 12:30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and all of your mind and with all of your strength. <clears throat> if we really believe what Jesus says, then we got to love him more than our parents or our children. If we really believe what Jesus said, then he should be the closest and dearest person in our hearts. Now, you know, I, I remember preaching a sermon some couple of years back about this very verse, <clears throat> about loving Jesus more than anyone else, more than our children, more than our parents. And it didn't sit well with some people because it's hard for us to really grasp not loving our children as much as we love God. But Jesus wasn't saying not to love your parents or children. He was saying that as much as you love them, and you know how much you would give your life for your child, you know how great a love that is, and God is saying not to not love them, but to love me more than that. How do we show God that we love him more than that? It's by our lives and how we live them out. <clears throat> our lives should look radically different in how we honor him and how we sacrifice him and show our daily love and devotion to him. Our love ought to look different than the love that we have for our families, our children, 
It ought to be a greater love. Why? Because I would give my life for my child. But let me tell you something. God has given his life for you and me and our children. And we should honor him and love him. So that verse in Matthew speaks to us not to not love our children, but to love God more than we even love our children. <clears throat> the next verse that I believe is going to change your life, if you truly believe it, and I want to keep emphasizing that, we can't just say we believe, we have to believe, and that will change how we live. Amen? <clears throat> we have to believe what we say we believe, and that will change our life. Amen? You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> sometimes I feel like you're so engulfed in what I'm saying that you're not responding to me, and I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. <clears throat> so, speaking of the same page, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. Here, this verse deals with your image. The first one, your love, now your image. It says in Romans 8, 28, beginning there, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Well, here's one we love to quote, especially the first part. We love the first part, don't we? God works all things together for the good of them who love the Lord. But when we look at verse 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. We get the bigger picture of what God's doing in our lives, in the lives of believers, when we encounter this verse. And when we encounter struggles, we start seeing that God works all things together for our good. In the New American Standard Bible, it's translated there that we discover that God causes all things to be for our good. So he say, well, I got all this trouble going on in my life. How can, how can that, any good come out of that? I'm telling you, when God is in control of your life, when you believe what God says in his word, then God takes bad situations, not that he changes them to be good in themselves, but he brings good out of them that benefit the believer. Now, I can think of some terrible things that have happened in my life. I can think of all kinds of times I've been in trouble and I look back at them and at the time it just looked like trouble, overwhelmingly, like a large tsunami crashing on me. And yet now looking back at them, I see how God used that in some way to grow me, mature me, strengthen me, and he does the same in your life. But we have to believe what God says. We have to see the, the trouble in our life and not be overwhelmed by it, but look at it and understand that no matter what, how bad, how dark it looks, God is going to cause something positive to come into our life because of what we've experienced in the dark times. Now, I'm not saying dark times get good. I'm not saying they, they become something that we like. I'm saying that because of them, we become the men and women, the boys and girls that God wants to mold and shape, and he uses all those circumstances in our life, good or bad, to mold and shape us into the image of his son. But only, we can only be shaped, we can only become into the image of his son when we believe that God is doing it for our benefit. Amen? Now sometimes I look back and I remember preaching last summer on Daniel, the book of Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my favorite heroes, and, and I think about what they went through. And I'm thinking, they're standing on the plane there, and all of those people are out there supposed to bow down and worship the idol of Nebuchadnezzar. And... And he says, anyone who doesn't bow will be thrown into the fire. Well, that's a dark place, isn't it? That's, that's trouble on the horizon. And yet, as they are looking at that situation, they're believing God. And they even said, whether God delivers us from the fire or not, he's still God. We will still worship him. 
and we will not bow a knee to the statue. That's how we have to be when we believe God's word. We have to face whatever's coming into our life and we have to take a stand and say, doesn't matter what it looks like, God said this, amen, that I will work good for all of those who are called according to my purpose. When we truly believe what God not only works in but causes the events <clears throat> in our life to conform us, to work in us like a potter's wheel and clay on that wheel. And as it goes around, the potter is shaping and molding that. You know, I've, I've watched a potter do shape a vase on a potter's wheel before, and I notice sometimes they're really putting a lot of pressure on that clay to get it to come into the shape they want it to be. Some of these dark times are pressure in our lives that God has allowed. And you know, if God has allowed it, why should I fear it? Why should I anguish over it when I know that my God is in control? Say, why would God let anything bad come into our lives? Well, sometimes he's trying to get our attention and correct us in some area of our life. Other times it's just used as pruning because we're already in his will doing what he wants, but he wants to shape us. And, you know, little hunks of clay <clears throat> on a potter's wheel, they get, you get a little lump sometimes, and they have to stop and pick them out. <laughs> and God sometimes stops our life and says, whoa, time out. We got to get rid of this in your life. This you do not need. And what I have learned, and I find this interesting, that God sometimes says, I want this out of your life, and it's not an evil or bad thing. In itself, it's not. It's kind of like money. Money's not evil in itself, but it's the love of money that becomes evil. And God sometimes says, There's things in your life that I want you because you are mine. Because, as Romans 12, 1 says, that we should be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is only our reasonable service, and not to be conformed to the world. But God says, I, I just want to change your life a little. I'm shaping and molding you. And therefore, I, I want this little area of your life. You just don't need it for me. You don't need it for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we want these things in our lives because we want them. And, and God is saying, no, if you're going to be the person I want you to be, we need to trim the fat. You know, a ribeye steak is really good. But even a ribeye steak with a master meat cutter trims the fat around a ribeye. Amen? They trim it. They don't leave all that fat on there when they grill it up for you. And God does that with us. He molds us and shapes us into his will. We won't doubt, worry, stress, or become anxious in hard times when they hit us if we're believing, believing God's word. The word believe in, in John's gospel and elsewhere in the New Testament literally means to trust, to lean upon. You're sitting on those chairs right now. Do you trust it to hold you up? Certainly you do. You're very comfortable, and you know that it's not going to fall. <clears throat> and that's what God says. I want you to believe me, to trust me. Instead, we have a peace. When we trust God, we have this peace because God is at work in every situation in our life to bring good into our life that brings glory to him. Can I get a hallelujah? That's what God is doing with us, shaping us, to bring glory to him. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it hurts, doesn't it? That pruning, that shaping, that molding, sometimes it's not always pleasant, but we need to recognize that God is doing it to bring us into the men and women that he wants us to be, to reflect him. The third verse that I, I really believe will change your life, this is a life, it deals with your life, Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, <laughs> where do I live? Christ that I now live in the body, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. If we really believe that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us, it's going to change our lives. If we really believe it. It's not just going to change us on Sundays. 
going to change us all during our life. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have sacrificed myself to Christ so that he can live in me. You know, we'd be much less concerned about our personal image and reputation if we really believed all of this. When we truly die to self, we no longer worry about whether we're going to get the proper respect or that attaboy or that whatever from other people. We're not looking to other people for approval. We're looking to God for approval. And if God approves of what we are, who we are, what we're doing, it really doesn't matter what anybody thinks, does it? We don't worry about what people think because we know who we are and we know what we're doing. We wouldn't be bothered with little misunderstandings that cast a negative light on us or situations that appeared to be to our disadvantage. We wouldn't be concerned about circumstances that humiliate us because we know who's looking at us and we know what he thinks. We wouldn't be worried about jobs that are beneath us. <clears throat> I remember my first church, and they called me as pastor, you know, pastor. And because it was such a small church, Diane and I said, hey, look, we, need a, we don't have a janitor in the church right now. Would you consider allowing us to be the janitors? So here we are in our first church, and I love to tell this story, although I don't tell it real often. But when I do, it just makes me remember who I am in Christ and what God has called me to do. And Diane and I were cleaning the church, and I was in the men's restroom, and she was in the women's restroom. We had the doors open. It was on a Saturday afternoon. And, and uh, I remember we're talking back and forth because the doors are open. And we can hear each other through the hallway. And, and uh, she said something to the effect, uh, we're cleaning these toilets. We were down our hands and knees. Anybody got on hands and knees clean toilets? Yeah. It's not a real prosperous job there, is it? You have to humble yourself to do that. And so I'm thinking, yeah, I'm the pastor of this church, and I'm cleaning the toilets. It's okay. You understand what I'm saying? Because not all that we do is glamorous for Jesus. Sometimes we have to get down to the nitty-gritty. So being crucified with Christ means that I'm taking on his name, his name. I can live knowing that he's got my back because it's his back that he's covering. That must be what Christ meant when he said, whoever loses their life for me will find it in Matthew 16, 25. Are these verses hitting home? If we'll take them home and we'll make them very real and believe them in our life, God will do miraculous things. Can you imagine taking these verses and God moving and because of our belief in these verses and then us taking the whole Bible and believing everything that we read? I imagine we would have a life-changing experience. <clears throat> the fourth verse that's going to change your life, if you truly believe it, deals with your strength. Philippians 4.13. The youth had this on t-shirts a few years ago. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me or gives me strength. How we love this verse because it appears to be our victory chant for the ability to do anything we want to do. Say, well, we need to do this or we need to do that. Well, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me strength. And he does. But I want you to know that we need to believe the truth of the verse and not how we just may misapply it sometimes. We perceive it as God wants me to prosper, therefore I can do anything. Isn't that what we do? I can do all things. Because why? Because I want to do it. But in context, the Apostle Paul was saying he has learned to live in whatever circumstances God puts him in. So let's back up to verse 11 and get this whole picture. Verse 11, Philippians 4. It says, Therefore I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, apply the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right? So, as you know that I have told you over and over, we need to look at who it's written to 
the context of the verse. We need to understand the culture and insight, and we need to take all those things in, and we need to apply God's word correctly. So what he is saying here is not some just proclamation we can make. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and, and conquer anything we want to. But Paul is saying that I've come to this point in my life where I have learned something of God. It doesn't matter what my circumstances are, that God says that I, he's giving me the strength that I can overcome them, I can make it through them. Why? Because he gives me the strength. But what have I learned? I, we gotta go back and see what Paul learned. I've learned to be content. I've learned to be satisfied. Whether I have plenty or I'm in need, it doesn't make any difference because I'm not focused on what I have. Whether it's clothes or food or home or job or car or retirement, I'm not focused on that, but I'm focused on Christ. So I don't worry about these things because my focus is on Jesus and I know that when I'm following Jesus, whatever I need, he promises this, to meet your need, whatever I need, God's going to take care of it. No matter what your circumstances look like. And I've had to remind myself of this verse time and time again because sometimes in life we get in dire straits and we're sitting here thinking, how am I going to survive? Well, we're going to survive because I've learned to be content in what I have, whether I have plenty or I am in need. It doesn't matter because my focus is not on what I have but on who I belong to. And in the last verse, we can't leave this out. We got to go to James. We got to go to James. Practical Christianity. The fifth verse deals with the change. It will change your life if you truly believe, and it deals with your growth. James 1, 2, and 4. I always have to come to this verse because I have to remind myself that no matter what I face, trial, tribulations, that I should consider it pure joy because God's in control. It says there in verse 2, beginning in chapter 1 of James, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, I love the book of James. Because he's so down to earth. He so speaks to right where we live today. But one of the most difficult struggles for believers is understanding that we have a struggle at all. Why do I struggle? Why do I have problems in my life? I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I love God. I serve God. So why have I got these issues going on? <clears throat> they might be financial. They might be relational. They might be your health. And we all get, as we get older, we start realizing that some of those difficult periods in our life are those years that we thought were golden. And they can be golden. But this verse packs a promise. Our testing and trials produce in us perseverance, which in turn results in maturity and completeness in Christ Jesus. In the New American Standard, we're told that endurance, the endurance learned through suffering will make us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, wait a minute. Does this mean in my Christian life I have to endure suffering and difficulties in order to become complete and the person that God wants me to be ultimately? Can I stand here and tell you yes? That is exactly what the Bible is saying. And you thought Christianity was a rose garden. No, let me tell you what, it's a blessed place to live your life, walking with Jesus. But Jesus didn't promise you a rose garden. I tell you, I have looked in this book, there's no rose garden in here. In fact, the Bible, if you hear it preached correctly, you're going to see that Jesus calls us to suffer, to suffer for his name's sake. Now that doesn't mean I'm in trouble all the time, but what it does mean is when it comes, don't act surprised. Because Jesus said he's going to use it, Romans 8, 28, to bless you, to grow you, to mature you. Yes, 
We want to be perfect like Christ. Now, obviously, we're never going to make that goal as long as we're here on this earth, but the very salvation that Jesus started, he's the author. He has also said he's the finisher. He is going to complete your salvation, the work he started in you. <clears throat> so God's word tells us straight out that we can be perfected in Christ. That doesn't mean we're... And I don't want to. I don't want to. You to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we will be sinless on this earth. I am. I will tell you this: that the more you believe of God's word, and the more you walk with Jesus, you will sin less and less and less. Sin will be an unusual thing in your life when you walk with the Lord. Someone said, "Well, I can't help it. I'm only human." Where do you get this cop out? I'm only human. No, you're not only human. You have a supernatural change that's taken place in your life when Jesus took over, when you invited him in to be not only Savior but Lord. And so you're not just human. So God's word tells us that we are going to have to endure some difficult situations. But when we actually consider them joy, they take on a new outlook, a new perspective, and they do not overwhelm us as they did. If you really, really believe this, it'd change your perspective on negative situations in your life. Because we know that we're on our way to maturity and completeness in Christ. I'm on my way, but I'm not a finished work yet. Are you? No. God's still working on us. And he has a plan for us to complete. And if we take these verses and others in the Bible, the whole Bible, God is going to do a work in our lives that we would not even dream of. And I know that as I sit and think sometimes, I think, well, God, I'm just one person. Here I am. You know who I am. You know my weaknesses. You know my faults. You know my shortcomings. How in the world would you use me in some miraculous way? Well, let me. here's what happens. Sometimes the miraculous is not spotlighted on you. It's spotlighted on him. For instance, God may want to use you to pray for someone. Yeah, you. And he may put on your heart to pray for a person. And so here you are praying for this person. It may be far or close. You're praying for them. And God works a miracle in their life, and nobody looks at you and says, man, that was a powerful prayer. They're looking at them, and they're seeing what God has done in their life, and he gets the glory, and that's the way it's supposed to be. But God will use you as you walk with him and believe <coughs> excuse me, what he has said. So let me close this this morning. Are you ready to really start believing these verses and live differently? because they will make you live differently. They will cause you to live differently. So let's not say we believe it, but let's believe God's word in our hearts. Let's let it settle into there so it changes our lives.